Good morning. How very good it is that you have come. This the first Sunday in Advent as we prepare once again for the coming of Christ into our lives, into our hearts, into our homes, into our communities. I'm so glad you're here as we make this connection together to God. Um, later in the service, there will be a time when, if you are so moved, to bring pledge cards of financial giving for 2000. And 22 to the altar. If you're like me, you would have forgotten to bring your pledge card. <laughs> Connie Keller has some if you would like one. Okay, they're out on the table. All right. So it is our tradition with Advent to light the Advent wreath and to begin us in that tradition. I've invited Denise, Cassie, Nikki, Maddie, and Abby to come forward. We light the first candle of Advent. We kindle it with ho hope. We long for you to come into our world to break through and reign with compassion, justice, and peace. We remember times we longed for God to be present to us, this congregation, and this world. This Advent we call out to God. Mighty God, creator of the world, break through all that keeps us from you. We ask for your mercy and reform us in your image. This Advent, visit us with your justice, love, and peace. Amen. Please rise for the call to worship. Something stirs deep within us, a longing, a hope. A thirst for joy, a hunger for peace, a yearning for blessing. We know deep within that our hopes and fears will be met by angel songs and baby sighs. It is Advent. The season of waiting, hoping, yearning. Advent. The time to go home. Our opening hymn is Come the Long Expected Jesus, the first verse. Find, ask, and you will be given. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. The deepest longings of our heart are met in Christ. We have gathered in his name. He comes to us with a love that is beyond measure, that touches that deepest, deepest need inside. You are the beloved of God. 
You are set free from the burden of sin and guilt and all that would hold you captive. This is a new beginning this morning. And so in thanksgiving, let us lift up our voices and sing together the song of Alleluia. which passes all understanding. It is a free gift that enters into the deep places of our hearts. Let's claim that peace that sets us free. The peace of Christ be with you. Please be seated. So we have an anthem this morning by the Motley Crew Christian Band. And uh, this is a song that I'm sure all of you know. It uh, comes from, its roots are in Liberia, Africa. And it began in Georgia uh, amongst slaves. It talks about the coming of God, calling for the coming of God.
So this is our time for the children. Thank you, Terry. So we just heard a song, which was Kumbaya, which means what? Come by here, Lord. And here at Advent, we talk about the ways in which Jesus comes to us. Jesus came to us long ago, 2,000 years ago, as a baby, a little baby that needed protection. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. And we also talk about Jesus is going to come again at the end. But here's the question. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Jesus will come again. But does Jesus come now? The famous author, Tolstoy, the Russian author, told a story. And I have a little video for you to watch. Long ago, there lived an old shoemaker named Martin. Martin lived alone in his humble shop, but his work was of the finest quality, and he was always honest with his customers. He tried to live the way the Savior taught. One night, as he was sleeping, he heard a voice. Martin, Martin, look tomorrow on the street, for I am coming. Martin awoke, unsure if he had been dreaming. That morning, he set to work as usual, but could not help but look steadfastly out the window onto the street, just in case his beloved Savior appeared. As he was watching, Martin noticed an old soldier out in the freezing cold, shoveling snow. Martin invited him into his shop and gave him something warm to drink. Later in the day, Martin noticed a young mother cradling a small child in her arms. She had no coat. Martin insisted she come in and warm herself by the fire. He learned that the day before, she had sold her shawl to buy food. After she had eaten, the old cobbler gave her some coins and gave her his own coat. In the evening, an old woman selling some apples appeared. A hungry little boy came along and tried to steal an apple, but the woman grabbed him and threatened to take him to the police. Martin rushed out into the street and begged her to let the boy go. Martin paid for the apple himself and gave it to the boy, who promised to not steal again. Martin returned to his shop and kept working and when night came, Martin put his tools away, disappointed that he had waited all day and his savior had not come. As he lit the candle, however, a voice whispered to him, Martin, Martin, did you not recognize me? From the dim corner of his shop, the old soldier, the mother and her child, the boy and the old woman stepped into the light. It is I, they whispered. And then the old cobbler understood. He pulled out his well-worn scriptures and read these words. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then Martin knew his dream had been real after all, and the Savior truly had visited him that day. So, did, did Jesus come? To Martin, how did Jesus come? <laughs> Which of you is going to speak? <laughs> Abby, you've been selected. How, how did Jesus come to Martin? That's perfect. Abby, you don't need to say any more. 
He disguised himself as other people. He came as the old soldier. He came as the cold, poor mother with the baby and came as a little boy who was fighting with the woman who was so hungry. He came in all of them. I realized just the other day that there was a tradition that I had every Sunday that I forgot about because of the pandemic, which was at the beginning of worship when I welcomed everybody, I would say, newcomers in our midst are Jesus come in disguise. How does Jesus come to us? Jesus comes to us in all kinds of ways. But one way he comes to us is to someone we don't know or someone we don't know well who comes to us in their need, just like the baby Jesus was in need of Joseph and Mary's care. Whenever Jesus comes to us in another human being who needs a loving, kind act, we are blessed if we can receive Jesus that way. And that's why we say, there's always room in the circle. So I want to pray with you all. Just uh, anybody you want to pray for, anybody you can think of who needs, needs Jesus to come and be with them, needs somebody to be Jesus for them. Anybody you want to pray for? Maybe. Ryan? Your teacher's Mom is sick, okay. All right. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus coming among us to share our life, born among us as a baby. Open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts to your coming among us even now. Coming in disguise as people who need a blessing, need kindness, need love. Help us, O Lord, to recognize you. We raise up everybody who's in need right now, carrying heavy burdens. We pray for Ryan's teacher's mom in her need and all who are feeling lonely or sad or hungry or with no place to stay like Mary and Joseph, seeking a place in Bethlehem. Help us, O Lord, to be the answer of other people's prayers. And hear us now as we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, kids can go to Sunday school. There's Lynn with others. There we go. And also, let's click. Let's wave to Michael. Hi, Michael. So good to see you. Jesus in disguise. Thank you, Michael. Okay, we're going to sing another verse of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. I invite you to stand. Please be seated. We have two readings for this, the first Sunday in Advent. The first comes from Paul's letter 
to the church at Thessalonica. And it's probably the first New Testament book that was written. Oh, hey, I should have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> that, that's uh, just to remind you that later in the service, there will be an opportunity for you to bring your pledge cards forward. And if you need one, uh, somebody can bring you one. OK, thank you. I forget sometimes what I have up there. Back to Thessalonia. <laughs> so Paul's first letter to the, is probably the earliest book of the New Testament. It's just maybe 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And Paul, it was one of the first churches that Paul started, and he had a great affection for the c congregation there. And, and this, these are words that he wrote to encourage them to keep the faith, keep following Jesus. Listen for the word of the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. There is a tradition here with the local fire department in which on the last Sunday before Christmas, what we call the fourth Sunday in Advent, they send their fire truck slowly moving through the neighborhood with its sirens on. There is a Santa Claus atop of the truck giving out candy canes. But it was the case for many years that they would come through our neighborhood precisely as we were beginning our worship service. And when you hear sirens, what do you think about? You think, oh no, what cataclysmic thing is occurring? And then we remember, oh yeah, it's the fire department. I think that maybe Bob Keller, who was a fireman, spoke to them and they made a point of not coming through our neighborhood at 10.30 in the morning, gratefully. But as I read over the gospel lesson, which occurs for this Sunday, uh, it seemed to me that maybe we should have asked them instead to come on the first Sunday in Advent, because Sirens blaring would make for a good soundtrack for what you're about to hear. If you've just put up your Christmas tree, this may sound kind of jarring, this imagery we encounter on the first Sunday of Advent. We hear uh, Jesus in the last week of his life talking about the, tr the tribulations that are going to come at the end times. And it, it's, it's challenging. So let's, let's listen now for the word of the Lord in the words of Jesus. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth. Distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. In the Bible, the, the sea is the, the symbolic expression of all that is chaotic and destructive in the world. The sea was seen as the place where chaos arises from. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this world. And that that day catch you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have 
strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Thus ends the reading. May God bless our hearing of the words. So for 40 years as a preacher, I've encountered this passage or the other ones in Mark and Matthew that are comparable on the first Sunday of Advent. And it's always been a kind of a challenge because as I said, we've decorated the church, getting into what we think of as the Christmas spirit. And this seems like the last thing we want to hear and how to make sense of it. And there's a particular challenge because the context in which these words were written down at first is altogether different in a certain sense from today. And that is that the earliest Christians lived with this powerful expectation that Jesus was going to return any day, going to return in their lifetime, that they were living in the last days of history, and that Jesus was going to come and bring in his kingdom. And that created a powerful motivation to stay focused on the state of their soul as they waited. But now... 2,000 years has passed, and Jesus has not come on the clouds in glory as people expected back then, and it's really pretty difficult for most Christians, myself included, to keep that expectation about Jesus coming on the clouds someday soon. And so that's the challenge. How do you interpret what's got to say for us now uh, in, in this situation? And yet it, it, it occurs to me that there is a sense in which all of us who are human beings live in a certain sense in the end times, which is to say our personal end times, insofar as none of us knows the hour or the day of our death. And at that point, we will stand before Jesus. Uh, the imagery that Jesus spoke of that's so jarring um, if you understand it sort of metaphorical, symbolically, well, it seems to me that every human life experiences some of what he's speaking about there, that sense of the, the threat of the chaotic forces of life that are like a swirling ocean going to drown us. We all have moments where we feel like that. There's a sense in which, as Jesus says, everything's passing away. You don't have to wait for the end of history to experience that now. It, it comes upon us that the experience of fear and foreboding, as Jesus said, is a part of what it means to be a human. And, and so what it, the question to ask is, what is the wisdom that's being offered here to us? As the years have passed, it's become easier for me to connect with this passage because uh, like many of you, it's hard for me to deny now that I'm living a lot closer to the day of my death than I am to the day of my birth. That the majority of my life story has been written, and I am in the end times, however many years I have left. Uh, I was particularly struck this week as I read Paul's words to the Thessalonian Christians. He says, he prays that God would strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. So Paul's inviting the Christians of that congregation and he's inviting us to, to go in our imagination to that day when we do stand before Jesus. Um, how are we going to feel about the life we've lived uh, as we go before, before Jesus. The word blameless that he prays for is a pretty intimidating word for me, I'd say. Uh, will we feel blameless when we go before Jesus? Well, I think back over my life, and uh, there are things that I regret, things that I wish I hadn't done or said, but I trust in the mercy of God that's been revealed to us in Jesus. And so I'm not deeply troubled by that. I, I believe that the heart of the gospel is mercy and forgiveness. 
there is a sense when I think about my life in which there is a regret that comes up, and perhaps you do too. Recently, I've been playing a lot of music and discovering new songs. I've been playing my banjo. And I came across this, this song that really spoke to me. Um, it's by... Uh, it's, it's by... <laughs> Uh, B Bell Bella Bella Fleck and his wife Abigail Washburn. I knew that Steve would know this, and it's somewhere in my notes, but I couldn't find it. Bella Fleck's the greatest banjo player alive right now, but his wife is. Uh, I think she wrote this song, and the the title of the song, "If I Could Speak to a Younger Me," and this is the chorus. If I could speak. If I could talk to a younger me, I'd tell me to go slow. This time on earth, it moves so fast. And when it's gone, it's gone. When it's gone, it's gone. That, that speaks to me. And I'm, I suspect those of you who have a hard time identifying yourself anymore as young could probably identify with those words as well. I tell my young self to go slow because this time passes so quickly. So the regret that I have when I look back on my life is about a sense that too often I was in a hurry to get through it. You know, there's always stress, there's always problems. And it's easy to get in this sort of hunker down attitude, this tunnel vision about, okay, let me just get through this. And then somewhere up ahead, I'm gonna be able to relax and appreciate. But it just keeps on going, you know? And uh, doing your job, taking care of your kids, whatever it is, the pressures of life that lead you to sort of just focus on getting through. And if I could do it over again, I would somehow tell myself to go slow because um, I missed a lot of it, it seems. Many of you are probably familiar with what is probably the, the greatest play, the American play. Uh, it's Thornton Wilder's Our Town. It was said before the pandemic that somewhere in America, uh, every night, there is a performance of Our Town, because in this beautiful little play, it speaks so clearly to what it is to be a human being. It takes place in this imaginary small town in New Hampshire called Grover's Corner. And in the course of three acts, you, you, you watch as the characters grow older, and in particular, there's a character named Emily. You watch her grow up. She becomes a wife. She becomes a mother, and early in the third act, she dies, giving birth to her second child. And in the imagination of the playwright, Thornton Wilder, he, he has Emily go and be beyond death in the realm of the spirits with the other spirits of people who have died in the town of Grover's Corners. And uh, Emily begins to intensely long for the opportunity to go back and experience a day of her life. Nothing special, just a day of her life. And the other spirits warn her that this is a foolish request, but she's adamant. She wants to go back and family to grant her request. And she asks for the, the, the day of her 12th birthday. And she wakes up in her home once again. And at first, there's this intense joy of seeing her mother and her father, younger, younger than they were. It's so exquisite, so precious. But as the day proceeds, there's this painfulness to it that arises because why doesn't my mother, why, why don't they see just how precious and beautiful this moment is? The disconnect from what she's experiencing, what she sees so clearly from her perspective about the beauty and preciousness of life is painful for her, painful. And finally, she sort of flees, takes her leave of of this ordinary day in her childhood. 
And these are the words she says, goodbye, goodbye world, goodbye Grover Corners, mama and papa, goodbye to clocks ticking and mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and new ironed dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. And back in the realm of the spirit, she speaks to the narrator, the stage manager, and says, do any human beings ever realize life while they live it every, every minute? And he replies, no. Saints and poets, maybe, they do some. I, I think we can resonate with that experience, right? You know, there are moments we have when we do catch a glimpse of just how incredibly beautiful and precious life is in spite of everything, but that's perhaps not the norm, you know? Emily's mother and such, going about the, the tasks of the day. Hard to focus on that. There's a sense of regret I live with about, I wish I could have been more present, present to my life as I lived it. Not just a hurry to get through. If I could talk to my younger self, I'd tell me to go slow. So much life is tunnel vision. So rare to truly stop and smell the roses. And so I, I hear in Jesus' words in this strange cataclysmic context as offering us wisdom in this regard. Uh, there are things that are going to frighten us in life. There's no getting away from it. To be alive is to deal with fear. He says fear and foreboding will come upon the earth, not just the end time. It happens in our lives, you know? Life has got a lot of fear in it. But there's a decision we have to make, day by day, really. Do we run from the fear, or do we face the fear? And I realize when I think back about my life, the reason I got so often into this kind of tunnel vision focused on getting through was a sense of fear. It was a fear that things were going to fall apart if I didn't desperately hurry to keep things under control. And that's what kept me from really living presently to the gift of my life. The sense of running from the fear. Um, and throughout the Gospels, Jesus is challenging his disciples to sort of face their fear, not run from it. Um, and so Jesus says in these lessons, stand up and raise your head, he says, which I take to mean, you know, don't hunker down. Face whatever the, the experience is at the moment, and if that includes fear, face the fear. Um, fear and love, there's a connection. You know, when fear overwhelms us, it's really hard to love. Uh, it's interesting in this song that speaks to me such, if I could talk to a younger me, it starts off this way. The, the verse is striking before the singer gets to if I could get to the younger self, the, the verse is this. Feel the fear inside your chest. Watch it ebb and flow. The darkest hour dies at the dawn. First, first clearing's yours to reap and sow. So the advice to go ahead, don't, don't run from the fear, feel it, feel it. And in doing so, you will find that in, in time it gives way. Fear gives way to the dawning of a new day. And then this verse, feel the love inside your chest. Watch it overflow. True love asks for nothing back. Take this world. It's yours to grow. That when we don't run from the fear, but face it, then we recognize that love is what is there deeper down. And we become present to one another and present to love. The story of the Good Samaritan, which comes from Luke's Gospel, one possible explanation for where the Pharisee, uh, not the priest and the Levite, hurry down the road and don't stop to be present to this suffering man is because they're afraid. They're afraid of of contamination, they're afraid that they won't get to the temple on time. And Jesus is in disguise, 
and that man at the side of the road, but they miss this encounter because of the fear. That when we truly become more present to our life and not in a hurry to get through it, then love arises within us innately. It is God's love that knit us together and it comes to us and we recognize that we really are all in this together. We're all making it through, you know, everything falling apart. Everything will pass away, says Jesus, heaven and earth, but my words, that is, the love that I have expressed, that doesn't die. That's the one thing that doesn't die. We'll move into it and lo and behold, the love begins to take control and life becomes an incredible blessing. The blessing it always was, but we just didn't see. And so, as you prepare for Christmas, if you're like me, you probably have these sense of regrets. But I am, what I'm glad about is in my latter years, I'm, I'm getting a little better at slowing down, a little better appreciating the moment, not succumbing to that pushed rush. And so thinking about your coming Christmas, Advent is about preparing for Christmas. What's that mean for you? Everybody got to shop for, all the Christmas cards you got, all the parties you got to plan for, all that stuff. Doing it perfectly, maybe. I don't, I don't know what it means for you, but I would just suggest you want a really good Christmas, make a point of not rushing through it. Be present to it. Be present to the people that you're sharing Christmas with. Be present to what you're feeling in the midst of it. That's what makes for a good Christmas. That's what allows the child to be born once more among us. May it be so. Please pray with me. Oh God, we, we thank you that you are here with us even when we are in a hurry to get through life. And you are with us, calling us to wake up, to be alert, to raise our heads, to notice just how precious it all is in fight, spite of the fact that so much is passing away. Help us as we move towards yet another Christmas to truly slow down and appreciate the love that is present to receive it, to offer it, to allow your child, your son, to be born among us yet again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And during the singing of our hymn, let it be an opportunity to offer ourselves to God with the intention not to be in a hurry, but to be mindfully present to Jesus in each moment. The hymn we sing at this time is, Take My Life and Let It Be, the first two verses. This is when we're going to come forward, and I'm going to show you how to do that first. Please rise.
those of you who are at home, I invite you to mail your pledge card into the church. And uh, we are grateful for the grace of God that makes it possible for us to offer our lives, which have been given to us as a gift. And this is the symbolic part of our service where our offering is held. There's an offering plate outside for you who are present. And for those of you at home, I invite you to mail your offerings in or to go to our website and make an offering through PayPal. Thank you so much for supporting our common ministry to share the gospel together. This is our time to pray together, to share our joys, our concerns, and to invite God's spirit into our deepest needs, that place perhaps that compulsively leads us to hurry through life instead of being present to it. So uh, let's pray together. Thank you, God, for this time you offer us to be together, to be still, and to return to ourselves, as did the prodigal son return to his self. We remember who we are, whose we are. We are yours, O oh God. It is you who have given us life. We need not be here, but for your were extraordinary love that called us into being, gave us this wondrous mystery that is life in the beauty of creation. And in spite of all that is hard and frightful, underneath it all is goodness, your love holding us. And as we return to that truth, gratitude arises within us. We are thankful for the beauty of the earth. We thank you for our children. We thank you for milestones in life, such as 17 birthdays. We thank you for those who've lived many years on this life, folks like Doris and Fred, and who shine a light as they have come to live so graciously in our midst. We thank you for those who have offered us Jesus in their love, who've encouraged us in our times of discouragement, those who've forgiven us when we have sinned against them. We thank you for those opportunities you've given us to escape ourselves in love, offering ourselves as the answer of prayers to others. We thank you for those who have wept with us and have waited for the rising of the sun after the darkness of the night. We thank you for those who've laughed with us, helped us to take a light touch, to return to the moment. We thank you for music that stirs our hearts. We thank you for those who put into words what it is to be a human being in a way that makes us feel connected. We thank you for the gift of our church and the grace that we have experienced here in all our fallibility. Lord, in your goodness, Tim Tyler, oops, come back. Tim Tyler shares that it was a joy to spend time with family again for the holidays. Uh, Joanne said it was awesome being with Julianne and Zen and her sister and brother-in-law for Thanksgiving. She even spent the night in Philly. Mady has a joy that she got a promotion at work to lead associate. We thank you for these blessings, O oh Lord, and so many that go 
unmentioned and so many that we ourselves are unaware of. You know us so much better than we know ourselves. You know the ways in which our souls are somehow blocked, our capacity to shine your light diminished. You know the ways we're stuck. You know the ways we need to be healed, forgiven, renewed. In this moment of silence, each of us would come before you, O Lord, seeking that you would come by here, come to us, to meet us in that place of our deepest need, whatever the shape that need takes. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you that your spirit works in our lives to make us a more hospitable place for Jesus to be born yet again. We thank you for that love that connects us to one another, that love that calls us to pray for one another. And we would raise up into your arms the persons and the situations you place on our hearts as a call to prayer. We raise up into your arms Anna Crystal's mother Muriel as she is in a nursing home with worsening dementia. We pray for Johanna, the sister of Betsy's and Paul's son-in-law Pete dealing with brain cancer and having surgery tomorrow. Be with her and the surgeons and all who are near to, and dear to her, including Pete and Ben as they are recovering from COVID and Paula in her exhaustion for caring for them while she has yet working. We pray for Diane Anderson and Charlie Kinsley, Barbara Simmons' friend Anita, Donna's brother-in-law Phil, my brother-in-law, Bobby, needing a kidney transplant because of COVID. Tom Albert's mother. Connie's son, Jonathan. For Tim and Anna. For June Snetzer, for Lynn Bostwick, for Doris and Fred, for Wachan, and for her friend, O. For Karen Wilk, Angela and Steve Bryant, Hetel, Cheryl, Paul's parents, Lynn's friend Cheryl, Shelley's friend Jan, Garrett's housemate Thomas, Amy Deeks, Aunt Marilyn, Diane Morgan. We pray for George Haddad and Gina Treza dealing with evictions. We ask a blessing upon Gina's son, Nick, and his three-year-old son, Avian. We pray for all who find themselves in a sense of terror regarding the future. May your peace descend upon them. We pray for all who are facing cancer or other life-threatening illnesses. We pray for the ongoing threat posed by COVID. We pray in particular now for the for wisdom to be given, given to leaders in the face of the new threat of the COVID variant. We pray for all who are suffering in hospitals and all who in their exhaustion are caring for them. We pray for those who are grieving, who've loved ones lost. For those who are feeling depressed, tempted to despair, isolated, help us, O oh Lord, to reach out to one another. Help us to be mindful, present to the moment, present to our impact on one another, physically and spiritually. Help us to be bearers of your peace, your healing, your reconciliation. We pray for our earth, 
We pray for the healing of that which has been harmed. We pray for better stewardship of the gift of our earth. We pray for people in faraway places who suffer in ways that's hard for us to grasp. In South Africa, Afghanistan, Haiti, the refugees at the border, and all those who are called to care and make decisions that affect many. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, prayers for Austin's guitar teacher, Alex Valencia, who is in the hospital. Prayers for Brian Bramley's mother, who is in the hospital with heart and other health issues. Prayers for um, Amy's Aunt Marilyn, who is doing well with her chemo, and her spirit and strength are amazing. Um, oh, we had one, one other joy that came through. Betsy and Paul um, are happy for the joy of technology that we were able to spend Thanksgiving with Paula and her family and the joy of having Nicole with them here and also the joy that Nicole finally made it home to Michigan early this morning. Her flight was delayed many, many times yesterday. Uh, prayers for... Charlie Kinsley, is ha Charlie Kinsley, who was having a bone marrow biopsy on Tuesday. Prayers for Dave and Dan's mom, Darlis Catalan, who is having a cardiac ablation procedure on the 2nd of December to control her AFib. Prayers for Dave and Dan's brother, Luis Catalan, who is having an MRI tomorrow to check out an injured hip. Also prayers for Dave and Dan's sister, Tina Hodges, who is home with COVID. Uh, continued prayers for John Keller for the healing of his ear and now a healing of poison ivy. Prayers also for Connie, who has a really bad case of poison ivy. Prayers for Mike Keller um, as he faces training in the field in Germany. Denise asked prayers for her brother-in-law, Tom, who was just diagnosed with prostate cancer and seizures. We raise these cares up into your everlasting arms, O oh God. We ask that you would Kindle the flame of our faith. Give us the courage to face the fears that we have to address in life and to raise our head up and live a life of love, a life that is open to joy, a life that recognizes your love as the deepest reality. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk with Jesus. and his precious name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is the third verse of I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Please rise.
the last, the last verse. I got, I got all the lyrics right to the very last page. So. You, you may be seated. You may be seated. You know the, you know the tune if you don't know the words. You, the tune's, the tune's good. It was a nice chant. So there is coffee hour today, both in person, hosted by Tom and Catherine and Jean, and online. Uh, you should have received, if you are an ongoing member and friend of the church, a letter with the stewardship card. I invite you to return it by mail or in person. There are opportunities to connect. Uh, Tuesdays with Joanne at 2 o'clock on Zoom, and Fridays with Betsy at noon. I lead guided meditation and prayer sessions on Wednesday and Thursday at noon. I invite you to join me on Zoom. United Methodist Women are meeting on this Wednesday for their annual Christmas party. On Zoom. On, on, on Zoom. Yes. On Zoom. Yeah, let Betsy know. If you're not a UMW member, you don't usually get our emails. Let Betsy know if you would like um, to attend, then she'll send you an invite. All right. The choir is back to rehearsing on Thursdays, and they welcome everyone willing to join their voice to the, to the chorus. Also, the Motley Crue Christian Pan invites anyone who'd like to join us. Uh, we want to continue to connect shoppers with people who need someone to shop for them. So let us know if you have that need. Also, I thank you for your support generously of the discretionary fund. If you're in need, please speak to me. We can help you. And the Parsippany's food drop, which paused during the Thanksgiving holiday, resumes this Friday at 1030 at Smithfield. Once again, thank you for your ongoing offerings and support. Any other announcements to make today? Okay. Um, oh, just, just a reminder, it was in the, in the Hilltopper too, but um, if you would like to order poinsettias um, for the altar, these are, these are not ours. The big poinsettias that are here, they belong to the Korean church. Um, we order the small poinsettias. <laughs> um, there was a notice in the Hilltopper but speak to Connie if you would like to order poinsettias and she'll get you set up. We have modest poinsettias. Modest poinsettias. <laughs> We're very unassuming. Yeah. Okay. All right. Please rise for the final benediction. Go forth to walk as a child of the light. Go forth to live your life with your heart, your mind, your body open to the very grace of God in each moment. Be attentive to Jesus in disguise. Come to you in those you will meet. Go forth to live out the good news of Jesus the Christ. In his name, amen. Thank you.